Hello everyone, I'm the Saxy Gamer, and today we're here for yet another Civilization VI Leader Spotlight, where today we are taking a look at the second of the leaders that was added recently in the September iteration of the New Frontier Pass, and that is Ambiorix of Gaul. Let's get straight into things with Ambiorix's first ability, which is King of the Eberwands, and it makes it so that his civilization will gain culture equal to 20% of a unit's cost whenever a non-civilian unit is trained. In addition to this, his melee, anti-cav, and range units will all receive plus two combat strength for every adjacent combat unit. This ability is quite strong, so the extra culture is very nice for helping you keep up in culture as you go throughout the game. So the playstyle for this guy is a little bit interesting because you kind of want to play multiple games at once. You can you can have a little bit of culture power, a little bit of domination power, and a little bit of science power as well from things that we'll talk about. But uh, this, this works towards that by giving you a little bit of extra culture as you train your military units, especially helpful in the early game towards getting you towards, I believe, the civic is military training, whichever one gives you the flanking and support bonus, just because those bonuses do stack additionally with these extra two combat strength from every adjacent combat unit. One other thing that I do want to mention is that this extra combat strength does apply for enemy units as well, so if you have a unit that is surrounded by 6 enemy units, that unit will still receive plus 12 combat strength from being, you know, adjacent to 2-6 uh, combat units. So, something that's uh, very interesting to consider whenever you're playing this guy, and it makes it so that pretty much no matter where you're fighting or what units are around you, you want to fight in as many clumped up scenarios as you possibly can. Whether that's moving your army as a clump, or maybe, you know, putting your guys really up in the face of your enemies, that way you can get the extra combat strength on those units. Ambiorx's second ability is known as Hallstatt Culture, and it makes it so that his mines will provide a minor adjacency bonus for all of his districts, they'll produce a culture bomb of unknown territory whenever you build them, and they also receive plus one culture. In addition to this, uh, the, the kind of the drawback to this is that his specialty districts do not receive a minor adjacency for being adjacent to another district, and you also can't build them adjacent to the city center, so you have to space them out a little bit more. Hallstatt Culture is an okay ability. I, it, it's not, it's admittedly not my favorite, so it does take a little bit to get used to just because it's sort of like playing the Maya, I suppose, where you have to change your play style a little bit with, and, and keep this ability very much in mind whenever you are playing the Gaul. So, the minor adjacency from mines is potentially really good if you end up with a really hilly spawn, but if you don't, then it can become really hard to get ad uh, adjacency on some of your districts because you're not going to be able to clump up your districts in order to, you know, get that adjacency on all of them since you don't receive any adjacency bonus from being adjacent to other districts. The other thing to keep in mind here, obviously, is that since you can't place these next to a city center, you have to be very mindful that you don't accidentally ruin a really good district spot, which I have done numerous times already when playing the Gaul. So something to just keep in mind whenever you are playing them is that you are going to have to leave that one tile of space between your city center and your district. So be very mindful of this, and you should be able to make very good use of this. If you're playing on Highlands Map or New World Age, then Hallstatt Culture is obviously quite good. But aside from that, it can be either good or bad depending on what your spawn's like. Let's now move on and talk about the unique unit for the Gaul, which is the Gezate, which is a replacement for the Warrior. So this is very nice because it means you get it very early on in the game, and this enables a really strong early push, which, as you all know from a lot, from a lot of my other videos, being able to do early aggression in Civ 6 is very, very strong. The other nice thing is that you will start the game with Era Score since you start with your unique unit. But the Gezate has a melee strength of 20 and a movement of 2, both of which are exactly the same as the Warrior, but it does have some unique abilities as well, so it gets 10 combat strength when fighting units with a higher base strength than it, and it will also receive plus 5 combat strength against district offenses and, you know, units in districts. So, the Gezate, I think, is generally a pretty good unique unit just because... Being able to get 10 combat strength when fighting units with a higher base strength means that these stay relevant for a lot longer than normal warriors would, and the fact that they get the extra combat strength against district defenses means that it's a lot easier to siege cities with them as well, or fight barbarian encampments because those count as defensible districts, so you do get this bonus against those districts, or those uh, barbarian encampments as well. One drawback to the Gezate, though, that, I don't know, it kind of irritated me in, in the most recent game that I've been playing, is that you actually cannot upgrade these guys into Swordsmen. They, they will upgrade into Musketmen, but you, you are not able to upgrade them into Swordsmen, which does actually kind of suck because the Gezate will never have a higher base combat strength than these Swordsmen, so the max you can get on these guys, obviously, would be effectively like 35 if you have 20 melee strength and then plus the 10 from fighting a unit with a higher base strength, and then 5 if that unit is also in a district, so... 
that's still one less than the swordsman. So these guys will never be stronger than a swordsman, and you you lose the ability to upgrade into them, which kind of removes a little bit of the effectiveness of like a mid game push once you've already started an early game push. It's, it's not it's not terrible because this unit is generally pretty strong already, but it is something to consider is that you are going to be missing out on that push. So there is no reason to rush iron working really whenever you're playing the goal. The Gull's unique district is known as the Opidum, and it is a replacement for the Industrial Zone, but it does unlock a little bit earlier with Ironworking. The Opidum's bonuses are that it will have half the usual production cost of an Industrial Zone, so just remember that district cost scales, so no matter what an Industrial Zone normally would be, this is going to be half the cost of that. It also receives plus two production if adjacent to a quarry or strategic resource. Notice that this is if, not from each adjacent uh, quarry or strategic resource, so if you have two quarries next to it, you're still only going to get two production. The other thing, though, is that, remember, you are going to get an, an additional plus 0.5 production from every adjacent mine, so you can stack it with that instead, so you're not limited to just having two production on these guys. The other thing that you get with the Opium is uh, outer defenses and a range strike if you have built walls in the city, so it, it kind of functions as an encampment, uh, except, obviously, it's it's a different district, so this is very good for defending your empire if you're being, if you're spawning near, you know, maybe very aggressive enemy or something like that, these do unlock quite fast with iron working. So I know I had just mentioned that you don't really want to rush for the swordsman tech, but I guess you kind of do in a certain way because you get your opium from it. So it's still something to make use of because early production is very strong because it will allow you to build out a lot more units and a lot of buildings very fast in comparison, just because, you know, four production in the early game is a lot more product or is a lot more valuable than for production in the late game, just because of the fact that things cost generally a lot less in the early game. So the Opium as a whole, I think, is a good district. I don't think it's quite as good as something like the Hansa, but it is still a fairly decent, unique district. And now it is that time to talk about the strengths and weaknesses of Ambiorix and the Gaul in the New Frontier Pass. So for the first strength, one of the things that I really like about them is that they have a very strong early push ability. So between the Gazette and just the fact that they get extra combat strength from having units adjacent to one another, it makes it so that you can really go very fast at another civilization and chances are you'll be able to beat them quite easily. The other really nice thing about this, especially on Deity with the Gazette, is that one of the biggest disadvantages on Deity is that the AI start very far ahead of you on Deity, and it takes a long while before you're able to catch up, generally. But with the Gazette, it doesn't matter as much if they have, you know, more advanced units than you, because you're going to be able to get that extra bit of combat strength, so it kind of nullifies the AI's, you know, early game bonus that you normally encounter on Deity, which makes them really strong. The other really good thing with the Gaul is that they are extremely defensible, so just the fact that you get pretty much, you can get effectively two encampments in every single city makes it so that you can get a lot of extra defensibility by putting units in those uh, districts and just having that extra wall attack effectively makes it so that it's very difficult for people to get through your land. The other nice thing is that if you have a lot of archers, you can clump them up as well, or, you know, at any ranged unit that you're using for defense. If you clump them up as well, you will get all that extra combat strength, which really makes it so that you can just shred through anybody that's trying to run at you. This is definitely a very, like, turtle kind of sieve in, in a sort of sense where... I generally think that you should go for a early game push, you know, take take some land, maybe maybe not entirely kill your nearest neighbor, but definitely take a lot of their land and kill them if you can. And then after that, you once you hit the opium, you pretty much just put a lot of those down, turtle up, and then go for a science victory. Speaking of science victory and weaknesses, though, one of their big weaknesses is that they really don't have that many bonuses that directly help a win condition. So as we've been talking about, you know, as I mentioned earlier on in this video, um, they can kind of play like the domination, culture, and science sort of thing. So they get some extra combat strength, obviously very helpful for domination. They are missing out on other good domination things, though, like unit production bonuses or extra amenities or extra loyalty. Same thing with culture. They get some a decent amount of extra culture, both from producing units and from putting down mines. But the bad thing there is that... By putting down mines, you're lowering your appeal, which makes your land less good for seaside resorts and national parks. And the other thing is, if you're going to go attack somebody, then people aren't going to want to be friends with you. They're not going to want to trade with you or have open borders, which hurts your tourism modifiers. And then, obviously, you know, they, I mentioned science as well, because, you know, they get a lot of extra production from their unique district, but they don't get any extra science yield. So, they have... A lot of things going for them, but it's kind of spread out over a multitude of win conditions and not really very well tailored towards any particular one of them. And now it is that time to give the Gaul their tier rating. So if you're new to the series, all that you need to know here is that this is the standard tier rating scale of S, A, B, C, D, and F, 
with S being the highest and F being the worst, obviously. So let's go ahead and get right into things with their domination rating, at which I think they deserve a B. They are definitely a fairly decent domination sieve. That extra combat strength is pretty nice for helping their units, you know, get some extra combat strength if they're surrounded or by, you know, surrounding themselves in a big clump and moving. Getting, a, like, up to 12 combat strength is definitely nothing to laugh at, so it is very good for fighting, and I think that's a big strength of the goal. The Gazette as well, obviously, as I've mentioned, is a very good, unique early game unit, and early domination is very important for starting the steamroll, or the snowball effect towards getting you towards late game domination power as well, so for those reasons, I think that they deserve a B. Science is up next, and I once again think that they deserve a B. They have a lot of extra production from their unique industrial zone, and they're able to get um, some good adjacency bonus on their campuses just by putting them next to mines if your terrain is like that. Um, but as I mentioned, though, they're generally not going to be getting any particular bonuses towards science yield, which is very important for making sure that you're able to get to those later space techs before other people. So for those reasons, they are still good at science victory, and I think deserving of the B. Culture is up next, and they're going to get, I'm sure you've probably already guessed it, a B. So they obviously get some culture from producing their units. They get some extra culture on their mines, both of which are very good and will help push you through the civic tree. But as I mentioned, they do have the drawbacks of mines lowering their appeal. Also, if you're going to be fighting, then people aren't going to want to, want to be your friend, which hurts your tourism modifiers. So they kind of have a little give and take with culture victory as well. So I think they are well deserving of the B. As far as religion and diplomacy are concerned, they're going to get C's in both of these categories. They really just don't have any bonuses for any of these categories. I guess with religion, you can get some extra holy site yields by putting down mines, but that's, you know, that's not exactly the strongest of bonuses, and uh, I think that they are going to be at least average in these. I guess you could maybe argue uh, D for diplomatic, just because you're probably going to be at least attacking someone early on, which is going to hurt your diplomatic favor generation if people don't like you. But either way, I think I'm going to still give them C's in both of these categories, because, you know, you can go for either of these victory types, but I don't see exactly why you would. And for their overall rating, I think that they are going to deserve, uh, I'm sure this probably isn't a surprise to you guys, but a B, just because they have a lot of victory types they can go for that they're decent at, but they're not particularly focused towards any particular one, and that kind of causes them to just lag behind a lot of the other sieves in terms of their ability to win a victory as a whole. Another thing that kind of maybe leads into this B rating is the fact that a lot of the other sieves that have been added to the game are very, very good. Obviously, you know, like Colombia or Ethiopia or Byzantium. So just because those sieves are so insanely strong, it's kind of, it's really upping the standards for what it takes to get an A or an S in the, in the game. So um, don't think that the B means that this is, you know, not that great of a sieve because they are definitely still a good sieve and a fun sieve to play. And if you have the new Frontier Pass, I would definitely try them out and, uh, you know, take a look at what their slightly different play style is with how you have to place your districts and how you can use mines and things like that because, as I mentioned, they are pretty fun. So thank you everyone for watching. I've been the Saxy Gamer. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like. If not, feel free to dislike. If you're looking for some more Civilization 6 content, feel free to subscribe. Thank you for watching, and goodbye.